Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start, at the least, on uh, my review of Billy Summers by Stephen King. So, my mum got me this for Christmas, so shout out to my mum, Mama Cobain, thank you very much, mother. And uh, I did ask for it. She asked me to send her some requests for things I wanted, and I was like, well, if, if you're going to get me a book, make sure it's one that I pick out for you. <laughs> so, as always, I'm going to go through, I'm going to read you the blurb. Um, I guess I'll read the rear dust jacket as well. Um, then I'm going to check out my tabs, and then at the end I will share my overall thoughts and ratings. As I say, I'm still in the process of reading this, so at the time of filming I'm on page 258 of 430, so a little over halfway. Um, but I want to make a start now, because otherwise I fall behind in my filming. And uh, it makes it a bit more like a reading -y vlog, you know? So, the rear jacket. Dane reads. Tonight, with summer past and autumn on the come, he lies awake, troubled. Not by the gun in the golf bag. He's thinking about the job he's agreed to do with the gun. As a rule, he never goes further than the two basics, taking the shot and getting out of dodge. This time it's different, and not just because it's the last time he plans to take a life for pay. It's different because it has a smell. So, rear uh, inside jacket blur. From legendary storyteller and number one bestseller Stephen King comes a gripping novel about a good man in a bad job. Billy Summers is a killer for hire. He's among the best snipers in the world, a decorated Iraq war vet who can blend into any neighbourhood and vanish like Houdini after the shot is taken, but he will only agree to the contract if the target is a truly bad guy. And now Billy wants out, but first he's offered one final job, an offer which is just too big to refuse. Billy is set up in the town of Red Bluff, with an office overlooking the courtroom steps from where he will make the hit. His cover story is that he's writing a book, so he begins to write. First about his childhood, then his days in the army, Fallujah. And soon he finds he has a growing thirst for the extraordinary power of storytelling. But the days still count down to the hit, and Billy becomes convinced that something about the job is wrong. He does not yet know just how wrong, or about the woman who will help him try to set things right. Part war story, part love letter to small town America and the people who live there, this spectacular novel features one of the most compelling and surprising duos in King fiction, who set out to avenge the crimes of an extraordinarily evil man. Billy Summers is about love, luck, fate, and one last unforgettable shot of redemption. Uh, very cool bullet motif there as well. Now, I will say, obviously, you've got the classic King trope here of having a character who's a writer. Uh, this one, at least, isn't a professional writer. He's sort of just getting started. Um, but uh, also, you have, like, a lot of excerpts from the book he's writing in this. And in contrast to Misery, where that kind of just did my head in a little bit and I, I felt like it really slowed down the story. In this, it really does work very well. And so Billy has like a dumb self that he uses and it says here, um, Billy's whistle isn't part of the act, which he doesn't think of as an act, but his dumb self, the one he shows to guys like Nick and Frank and Paulie. It's like a seatbelt. You don't use it because you expect to be in a crash, but you never know who you might meet coming over a hill on your side of the road. This is also true on the road of life, where people veer all over the place and drive the wrong way on the turnpike. And it, it's also, again, as it said in the blurb, it's his last job, and I thought this was interesting because it's kind of King reflecting on some of the storytelling tropes that are out there. So he says, Billy doesn't mind. He's thinking of all the movies he's seen about robbers who are planning one last job. If noir is a genre, then one last job is a subgenre. In those movies, the last job always goes bad. Billy isn't a robber, and he doesn't work with a gang, and he's not superstitious, but this last job thing nags at him just the same. Maybe because the price is so high. Maybe because he doesn't know who's paying the tab or why. And just this little throwaway line here that I thought was interesting. Uh, Lady Justice is based on Eustace, a Roman goddess more or less invented by the Emperor Augustus. And we get this. Um, so I don't have the hero's journey, I have the writer's journey, but um, they're both famous books um, that are about the art of writing basically. So Hoff says to Billy, uh, Hoff being the guy who owns the building that he's going to make the shot from, he says, you ever read a book called The Hero's Journey? Billy has, but shakes his head. You should, you should. I just skim the literary stuff to get to the main part, straight to the meat of a thing, that's me, cut through the bullshit. Can't remember the name of the guy who wrote it, but he says every man has to go through a time of testing before he becomes a hero. This is my time. By supplying a sniper rifle and an overwatch site to an assassin, Billy thinks. Not sure Joseph Campbell would put that in the hero category. And his backstory, obviously, he's um, he's there to write a book, so somebody's kind of posing as, an, as his agent. Um, 
And this guy says, most of the agents say no because they stick with the proven earners like James Patterson and the Harry Potter babe. I read a blog that said it's a catch-22. You need an agent to get published, but until you're published, you can't get an agent. So again, I, I like. I think this is an interesting one to read as a writer. Uh, it probably offers more insights into the art and the business of writing than any of the other books with writers as a character by King that I can think of. We get a little throwaway line. Uh, he, got, he buys two burner phones, an air and a spare. Um, which is, I think King's actually mentioned that in a previous one of his books as well, but an heir and a spare is what uh, the royal family based, or what is referred to as when royal families have kids, so like for example in the, the British royal family, uh, Prince William is the heir and then uh, Prince Harry is the spare in case something happens to William. And um, so Jim Albright, uh, who's a lawyer, he wants to know uh, what, Billy's, what Billy's book is about and Billy says, um, he's not going to tell him, top secret. Um, and then he says, I admire your discretion. I thought writers love to talk about what they're working on. I think writers who talk a lot probably don't write a lot, Billy says. But since I'm the only writer I actually know, I'm really just guessing. I think it's probably true. Uh, Billy also has 2010 vision, which is what I have as well, which basically means you can see at 20 yards what people could normally see from 10 yards. Um, and so because of that, he can't wear glasses because they really screw with his head because obviously he doesn't need them. He's like the opposite. He's got really good eyesight, which you would expect for a professional sniper, you know. Maybe I'm in the wrong job. And I thought this was cool. Again, another sort of little bit behind the scenes of creativity, something I didn't know anyway. He says, um, the whole job, it feels not big wrong, just a little wonky. It's like one of those shots you sometimes see in a movie where the camera has been slightly tilted to give you a sense of disorientation. Dutching is what movie people call that kind of tilt. And that's how this job feels, dutched. Uh, at some point he buys some stuff and he pays cash because cash has amnesia, which I thought was a great line. And um, one of his new neighbors, when he's kind of living under this alias, bakes him some cookies. And when he goes home, he throws them into the trash because you can't even bear to look at them because um, they remind him of some bad stuff. And I just thought, I've done that before as well when people have like given me a cake or whatever. And it's like, is it a vegan cake? I I'm not gonna eat it, but I don't wanna you know what I mean? I don't want to just turn it down, so I'd take stuff and then just bin it. Billy also says he found that if you lie about business travel to cities of secondary size and importance in the economic scheme of things, people believe you. And that's true, like if I lied and said, oh, I've got to go to Coventry for something, people would be more likely to believe it than if I said I had to go to Tokyo. And he's writing his book and, it, and uh, King writes, now he understands he never did before, never even considered it, that any writer who goes public with his work is courting danger. It's part of the allure. Look at me. I'm showing you what I am. My clothes are off. I'm exposing myself. And then in where, in his book where he kind of writes in character as the dumb self and he's writing about his childhood and he writes um, that his mum got a new bad boyfriend and, and, she, and he writes, I don't know why my mother would go back to the same types of men after what happened, but she did. She was like a dog that pukes and then laps it up. I know how that sounds, but I will not take it back. And uh, he ends up in a foster home that he calls the House of Everlasting Paint because they're constantly paying the kids $2 an hour to repaint it. Um, and he says, What I learned in the House of Everlasting Paint, there aren't just two kinds of people, good and bad, like I thought when I was a kid who got most of his ideas on how people act from TV. There are three. The third type of people go along to get along. Those are the most people in the world, and I think they are grey people. They will not hurt you, at least on purpose, but they won't help you much either. And uh, I actually have this theory, like I think of people as having colors and gray people are like boring people who have nothing about them. And, and his theory kind of fits in with my theory. And um, Billy's in line at a checkout and someone has to go like, sir, so you're next. And he goes, sorry, I was wall gathering, which just makes me think of Charlie Heathcote here on YouTube. In fact, I'm watching one of his wall gathering videos sort of in between filming. So um, Billy ends up lying in his bed and thinking about his time in Iraq and we get the, these couple of paragraphs here which I think are really interesting and worth, worth a share. He hopes the waiting period will be short, not just because Don and Beverly being gone is so convenient, but because the hours spent in Gerard Tower are going to hang heavy without Benji's story to work on. Fallujah comes next and Billy knows some of what he wants to say, some of the brilliant details he wants to capture. Those shredded garbage bags caught in the palm trees, blowing in the hot wind like flags. How the mud showed up in taxis to battle the marines, piling out of them like clowns out of the little car at the circus. Only the circus clowns don't pile out guns up. How boys in 50 cent and Snoop Dogg t-shirts served as ammo runners, darting through the rubble in their battered Nikes or Chuck Taylors. How a three-legged dog with half a human hand in its mouth went trotting through Jolan Park. Billy can see the white dust on that dog's paws so clearly. The pieces are there, but no way he can put them together until this job is done. According to William Wordsworth, the best writing is about strong emotion recording tranquility. 
Billy has lost his tranquility. We get this little exchange, I just thought this was fun. I mean, everyone finds last words interested, right? So, Jim raises a finger and recites, no man on his deathbed ever said, I wish I had spent more time in the office. Oscar Wilde, just before he passed into the great beyond. He could tell Jim that Oscar Wilde's last words are actually reputed to have been, either that wallpaper goes or I do, but he just smiles, because he wants to protect his dumb self. And so he's looking after some plants for his neighbors and he has this like, I think very human thought where he just goes, I can't get nailed. If I do, those fucking plants are gonna die. As though that's like the most important thing. A kind of similar thing to what he said earlier. He says, when you're on the run or in hiding, cash is king. And uh, again, a little bit more musing on, on the craft of writing. Um, he thinks writing is also a kind of war, one you fight with yourself. The story is what you carry and every time you add to it, it gets heavier. All over the world there are half-finished books, memoirs, poetry, novels, surefire plans for getting thin or getting rich, in desk drawers, because the work got too heavy for the people trying to carry it and they put it down. Some other time they think, maybe when the kids are a little older, or when I retire. So when Billy was in the army, he got himself a shirt that said, Charlie don't surf, which is a quote from Apocalypse. Apocalypse Now? Yeah, it is Apocalypse Now. And so, uh, anyway, after he takes the shot, he ends up in uh, in a hideout, and that's where he meets this sort of female character that's like the other half of the duo, essentially. And, um, yeah, he, get, he picks her up because she gets thrown out of a car outside his house. Um, she's drunk, well, she's been date, date raped, basically. Uh, trigger warning here, but I wanna read it out because I think it's well written, but just painful sounding. Billy thinks I'm fucked. No matter how this goes, I'm fucked. He drops the towel and reaches for her, planning to roll her back onto her side that she, so that she won't choke if she throws up again, then rethinks. He takes her right leg and lowers it so her heel is on the floor and her vagina is revealed. The labia are inflamed bright red and split in several places, one of the splits still beating up fresh blood. The flesh between her vagina and her rectum, he knows the word for that part but can't think of it in this stressed out moment, is torn worse than her labia and God knows what damage there might be inside. He can see several dried splats of semen as well, most of it on her lower stomach and in her pubic hair. He was talking about the gooch or the perineum, I believe. Uh, and then, so this, this woman's having quite a few panic attacks, which is understandable. Um, and he shows her a few tricks that he picked up when he was in the army. So he tips her head back himself gently and drapes the washcloth over her eyes, nose and mouth. Then he waits. After, after 15 seconds or so, her breathing starts to ease. She takes the washcloth off her, off her face. It worked. Breathing, breathing the moisture makes it work, Billy said. So I'm gonna try that next time I have a, a panic attack. The other thing is that he gets some singing um, Teddy Bear's Picnic. Again, this is something he picked up in the army. There's a, um, a mention of a fog hat cover band as well. And I'm like, are fog hat big enough and well known enough to have a cover band, I mean, I, I guess. So we get a few references to COVID as well, where, uh, for example, this. He tells her about the Jensens and how they went on a cruise, neither of them knowing that in another six months, the cruise lines will be shut down, along with just about everything else. Which I think is quite a, a nice way of handling it. it, kind of keeps the realism. And then she says, um, this has got to be the deadest neighborhood in the whole city. Billy thinks of telling her that dead, like unique, is a word that cannot by its nature be modified. He doesn't because she's right. And then just another mention of COVID here. So uh, neither of them knows, no one does, that a rogue virus is gonna shut down America and most of the world in half a year. But by their fourth day in the basement apartment, Billy and Alice are getting a preview of what sheltering in place will be like. So just like that, because again, I mean, she's kind of in hiding essentially because she's got bruises and everything from the assault and she doesn't want people to see her like that. He's hiding from the law. So they are effectively, you know, in isolation, in quarantine, in this basement apartment. A bit like the apartment I used to live in before I moved here. It was horrible there. So I like this little exchange. We get, um, well, she says, shit happens. Life is a party and parties weren't meant to last. He looks sideways at her, a little startled. Is that F. Scott Fitzgerald? Prince, she says. Very nice. I've seen Prince. He played at Hot Farm Festival when I went there. Uh, they go to see Bucky as well, and Bucky's smoking Pall Mall, and Billy didn't know they still made those. Um, I do, but only because I used to smoke Pall Mall back when I was a smoker, before I started smoking roll-ups, because they're like a cheap cigarette brand. And we get this as well, which ties it in to um, the rest of the King multiverse. So Alice says, uh, way across on the other side, this is crazy, but I thought I saw the hotel you talked about. Then I blinked my eyes, the wind was so strong they were tearing up. And when I looked again, it was gone. Bucky doesn't smile. You're not the only person who's seen that. I'm not a superstitious man, but I wouldn't go anywhere near where the Overlook Hotel used to stand. Bad stuff happened there. 
Yes, it did. It did indeed. And then Billy sees a painting and he says, uh, he gets up for a closer look because it's in the far corner. Weird place for a painting. And the morning light doesn't quite reach there. It appears to show a bunch of hedges that have been clipped into animal shapes. There's a dog on the left, a couple of rabbits on the right, two lions in the middle, and what might be a bull behind the lions? Or maybe it's supposed to be a rhinoceros. It's a poorly executed thing. The greens of the animal's too violent. And the artist has for some reason plinked a dab of red in the lion's eyes to give them a devilish aspect. Billy takes the painting down and turns it to face the wall. And obviously that's a reference to what happened at the Overlook. And uh, Taco, who's in the army, used to wear Johnny's English leather as uh, aftershave. And Billy wrote, he put it on a little every day, rationing out his own private lucky charm. I remember him once saying to me that no man could die smelling like a gentleman. God wouldn't let it happen. And then when he puts the painting back, it seems as though the animals have moved around in it. Um, and also, so there's a, just a reference to music, uh, ACDC Metallica, and then it moves on to Tom Waits croaking 16 shells from a 30 or 6. Uh, and I just enjoyed that because I'm a big Tom Waits fan. And um, so Billy leaves this truck. They buy this truck, which is kind of using his camouflage. He's trying to kind of come across as the, a bit of a redneck, I suppose. But he leaves all this equipment on it and it says, The first thing Billy does the next morning is to check the back of the old Dodge truck because the tools are only tied down, not locked down. Everything is present and accounted for. He's not surprised, partly because everything in the truck bed and trailer is old and pretty clapped out, but also because his experience over the years has taught him that the great majority of people are honest. They don't take what isn't theirs. People who do, people like Trip Donovan, Nick Margerian, and whoever is behind Nick, piss him off mightily. We get a little line here, um, somebody shows up for a second time and King says, because every character in a story must be used at least twice. Dickens' rule, and Zola's because the main character is reading Zola. We get use of the word Smeg, which as a Red Dwarf fan, I very much enjoy. Um, King used it in the same way that Red Dwarf does as well, just to mean like crap or shit or whatever. But technically Smeg is Smegma. Um, we also get this line, um, so he's thinking about superstitions and he says, he has lost another good luck charm. He can tell himself that's nothing but superstition. No different than folks believing there were ghosts in the old hotel in Sidewinder that burned, but it makes him feel bad. The old hotel, of course, being the Overlook Hotel. Picture of the hedge animals gets put up again and he goes, uh, Billy could swear the lions are closer now, their eyes redder. The hedge bull is between them instead of behind them. It was that way before Billy insists. It must have been because pictures don't change. And what I like about this is this, just again, and some nice little references back to The Shining, but it's never like explained or there's never any closure. It's one of those unexplained mysteries. And it kind of hints that even though this is very much like a realistic novel with realism, um, it does still have that little tiny bit of like magic and hocus pocus in it, but not enough that it just devalues the rest of the story, you know? Um, we also get a reference to D.B. Cooper, who is a guy, he was never discovered who he was, but he hijacked a plane and parachuted out of it, basically, and was never discovered who he was, and it's just a very cool little bit of, like, true crime history, I suppose. But yeah, Billy Summers by Stephen King, I would have to say the master is back at work with this one, really enjoyed it, I think it's probably his best of the, at least the last couple of years, um, and it was cool that it was more realism focused, because actually I think I enjoy that more with King than when he's messing around with magic and superstition and all of that stuff, I mean he did do a lot of that in like his early career, but I feel as though he's kind of done with that now, and so when he's writing something that's like more of a gritty crime kind of novel or a thriller novel, and then he puts some magic in it, it always annoys me slightly because I guess it just ruins that suspension of disbelief. Um, but yeah, really strong novel. I gave this a pretty high four out of five. Would definitely recommend Billy Summers by Stephen King. So there we have it, that's what I made of Billy Summers by Stephen King. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.